Yeah, we'll do it right after the roll, actually. So I'll turn it over to you for introductions. We'll call the uh, school committee meeting to order. We'll do the salute to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Ms. Martin. Ms. Clark? Here. Mr. Dakota? Here. Mr. Dillon? Here. Ms. Doherty? Here. Mr. Hoey? Here. Mayor Leahy? Here. Seven present. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn the mic over to the superintendent to do a, uh, introductions of a couple of key roles, a couple of important people that are coming into our community. Mr. Superintendent? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, School Committee. I'm really honored tonight uh, to be able to introduce uh, two of our newest school-based leaders. Uh, we've made a commitment to the community to make sure that we have the best school-based leaders in the country that will bring the best talent in the country to Lowell. We also made a commitment that we're going to engage the community in the entire process to make sure that not only are we getting the very best leaders, but we're also making sure that they're the very best fit for our great city. So the two people I'm going to introduce to you, uh, to you tonight are not new to our community because they've taken part in a very, very open process. Uh, both of them took part in the Lowell High School process and I'm very, uh, very honored to be able to introduce both of them in new leadership roles here for Lowell Public Schools. So Dr. Guillory is going to share a little bit of their bio and then they're going to have a little bit of remarks here for the committee. Uh, but we are going to, we're introducing tonight uh, Ian Charles as the new principal of the Sullivan School and Michael Fiato as the new head of school at Lowell High School. <laughs> Dr. Guillory is going to share a little bit about their background just to further acquaint the committee with their backgrounds and then each of them will provide brief remarks to introduce themselves. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent, to the school committee. Uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Ian Charles and Mr. Mike Fiato um, as the new leads for both Sullivan and LHS. Mr. Charles began his career in education as a long-term sub in 1998, serving the Lowell Public Schools community. Um, he's uh, specialized in the field of special education, humanities, and social studies. He worked at the Rogers, the Robinson, and the Pine while attending UMass Lowell. Uh, he was a resident of Lowell during this time, and his uh, children attended the Pine Arts School. Um, Mr. Charles then went to Olympia High School to serve as a history and economics instructor. He later returned to Massachusetts, where he served as a social studies, a social science instructor at the Peabody Middle School in Cambridge. He was later hired in Helford, uh, Medford uh, to help lead McGlynn Middle School. His exceptional work as an educational leader got the attention of Medford Public School community and the district administration. He was then appointed to serve as assistant principal at Medford High School, where he oversaw the successful transition of incoming freshman class. And then he later transitioned to Codman Academy um, Charter School in Dorchester, where he served as a principal. So please again welcome Mr. Ian Charles. It's not so often that people have an opportunity to go full circle with their careers. Um, Lowell has been a very important part of my life and has helped me to solidify my position as an educator and leader in education. And it makes me feel really good to have an opportunity to come back and serve the people of this great city. It's one of the most diverse cities in Lowell. Lowell is in Massachusetts. And I'm, I pray that I will continue to do the good work that you guys have helped me to do along my, along my many years as an educator here within the city. 
Um, and for the folks who are watching this, who are at the Sullivan Middle School, get ready. <laughs> get ready. We are going to be exceptional, and we are going to continue to be exceptional for the many years to come. Thank you very much. Michael Fiato is a passionate and visionary educator with over 20 years of experience in the field of public education. Michael most recently served as a targeted assistance manager for the statewide system of support at the Department of Ed Elementary and Ed Secondary Education. In this role, Michael partnered with schools and districts that have been identified as requiring assistance and intervention in the state accountability system. Prior to joining DESE, Michael served as the headmaster of Lawrence High School and has extensive knowledge of school improvement, redesign, and turnaround practices at the secondary level. In his role as headmaster, Michael was instrumental in developing an early college program and career pathways for students. This model includes an internship program, partnering with public and private sectors, and the, the development of career pathways where students have opportunities to deeply explore scientific industry as well as career-related things. Fueled by a belief that all students should have access to high-quality academic and enrichment programming, he also expanded opportunities through better funding and support for theater, music, and the arts. Please welcome Mr. Michael Fiato. Good evening, and thank you for having me today, and thank you for this awesome opportunity to join the Lowell team. I know there's a lot of great things happening in the Lowell community, and I'm excited to join the team. And I really want to learn a lot more and get to know the community much better. Um, I come to you, as uh, Dr. Guillory said in my bio, with 20 years of experience at the high school level, working in a large urban school. I understand that Lowell has um, about 189 years of tradition that is, fuels the school pride and also um, provides our young people with an option to become, an opportunity to become productive citizens, to become future leaders, and to become well-versed in what it's gonna take to be adaptive in the 21st century. So I, I really look forward to working, getting to know the community well, getting to know the teachers well, the families, and I can't wait to start working with our students. So I wanna really thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm very humbled to serve and I will continue to uh, get to know each, each and every one of the school committee members, our elected officials, and I'm proud to join the team. So I want to thank you for this opportunity and for having me here tonight. Thank you. So we said we're committed to bringing the best talent to Lowell because we believe that we can be the highest performing school district uh, in the state and in the country. And we believe that because we have the greatest teachers, we have the greatest leaders, We've got the greatest school committee. We've got the greatest mayor. So you're joining, you're joining a winning group, all that support our 14,500 superstar students each and every day. Uh, so welcome to Lowell Public Schools. I would say big shoes to fill, but I think I just, just told you the team you're joining. We're ready to support you. We're here to support you so you can support our teachers and our kids. So welcome. Thank you very much. Any comments? Anybody? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. We appreciate you uh, taking the challenge on, and uh, we're here to support you and uh, all the best. And we have many fine homes across the city, so anybody wants to move in and really get a good <laughs> feel for the community, we'll get you a house. So thank you. <laughs> Andy's ready to sell his, so. <laughs> All right, we'll jump right into the minutes. Need a motion to approve the minutes of the Lowell School Committee on June 3rd, 2020. Special meeting minutes of June 3rd, 2020. Special meeting uh, minutes of June 8th, 2020. And special meeting minutes of June 11th, 2020. And place them on file. So motion by Mr. Dakota, seconded by Mr. Hoey. Um, motions. First motion of the night. 5.1 by Jackie Darty. Request the Lowell School Committee join with the MS, MASC and other school committees across the state in support of a resolution regarding full state reimbursement for COVID-19 expenses. Seconded by Mr. Dakota, Ms. Darty. 
Uh, thank you, Ron. I think the motion pretty much speaks for itself. There's a full printing of the resolution in your packet. I don't know if you want to uh, take that, Mr. Superintendent, during under new business on the agenda? Yes. Okay, we'll do that under new business. So just so my colleagues are aware, uh, this resolution has been circling throughout the state. Um, as I mentioned, it's an MASC along with it started out in Amherst, Mass. Um, and every day more districts are unanimously voting to get on board to ask the state as you're making these mandates around COVID-19 to provide the funding to pay for them. So that's basically what we'd be doing. Mm -hmm. And we can take it up when it comes on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Second motion of the night by Ms. Clark. Motion to have Lowell School Committee participate in collective bargaining with all unions instead of the Human Resource and Labor Relations Subcommittee. Seconded by Mr. Dillon, Ms. Clark. Okay, the complexity of the issues that we're facing right now, I think it's best that we have all voices at the bargaining table. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I was just saying because of our current situation with COVID and some other complexities that we're facing, I think that it's important to have all voices at the bargaining table. Okay. Uh, why don't we do a roll call on this? No further comments? We'll do a roll call. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Thank you. 5-3, uh, motion by Ms. Clark. Uh, motion to close offices and schools on July 3rd, 2020 in recognition of July 4th holiday, which falls on a Saturday for building services personnel and requests that administrative assistance use it as a paid holiday pursuant, pursuant to their contract in light of the current budget situation. Seconded by Ms. Doherty, Ms. Clark. So because the uh, July 4th holiday falls on a Saturday this year, there are two bargaining units that have it in their contract that they could potentially take, um, instead of taking the day uh, off on Friday, could potentially receive a sixth day of pay uh, for the week. And I think um, given the current uh, circumstances um, with the budget uh, crisis that we're potentially facing, I we would like to ask that, um, that we all observe the Friday, July 3rd as the holiday. Thank you. Thank you for finding that. Uh, roll call. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Thank you. Uh, report to the superintendent. Mr. Superintendent. Mr. Superintendent? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, school committee members, uh, millions and millions watching worldwide, this is that time where we do uh, our updates for the school committee and tonight's update you should expect each meeting going forward either we're taking action on the budget or we're receiving an update on the budget uh, and tonight's update if we could do we have the clicker pardon me <sighs> so Ms. Turner is going to take the committee through this presentation uh, we're going to share with you the update we have on the revenue forecast which Again, it may sound redundant to the to the committee, but I think important for us to continue to update the community with, in some cases, what we don't know. There's a, also want to take the committee through our approach to cost savings because while we don't know what the revenue will be, in all likelihood, we know it's not going to be a positive fiscal outlook for the state. We'll take you through the steps we've taken now up to this point to ready ourselves for that potential revenue forecast that may not be positive. This committee's taken a number of really important steps dating all the way back to March that has put us in a position now uh, where I've heard from other members throughout the state that we're in a better position because of those steps that were taken early in March. I just heard from a, a member of a, one of the state organizations who suggested that she's hearing more information coming out of Lowell than she's hearing in some of the other communities she works in and she was appreciative of the information coming out from Lowell. I want to take you through the scenario-based planning. Again, different language with scenario-based planning. Sometimes it's called contingency planning, but 
for our community. We don't know what plan A is yet, so there are no contingency plans. These are scenarios that we're working through. You're gonna hear the scenario planning for the budget, and then you're gonna hear after that a report on the scenario planning around our academic model for next year. We're also gonna take you through what are other p potential future reductions that the committee may want to have conversation about if the budget continues to move in the direction that we're hearing at the state level, which right now stands at over $6 billion in potential shortfall. And then we'll take you through the next steps with the 112 budget, which uh, is new territory for the school district, and take you through the next steps to make sure we can operationalize the committee's vote at the last meeting, and then the timeline before you, as well as an opportunity for the committee to share with us any additional analyses that would be beneficial as we work to make sure we can inform you and our community all along the way. So Ms. Turner, if you could. So as, the super, so as the superintendent said, we don't have any additional information since the governor's initial proposal in January prior to the COVID-19 economic shutdown. Since that time, we've been notified by various official outlets, including DESE, that the governor's initial projection is no longer valid. The House and Senate will be working jointly to develop a new revenue forecast for the state budget. Current forecasts have the state losing more than $6 billion in revenue in FY21 due to the pandemic. The state received federal stimulus money in May. Of that amount, Lowell Public Schools is eligible to receive $4.1 million, which can be applied toward the FY21 expenses. How do you do that? Let's see. Okay, thank you. That's All right. So to share with, uh, with the community, the approach we've taken here to cost savings within an environment where we have limited information is to operate transparently and responsibly, ensuring a seamless flow of information and extreme fiscal prudence in decision making without creating unnecessary chaos within the community. That's a balancing act that we can't continuously reflect on. Uh, you will see, and as, other, as you've seen other communities undertake this conversation, they've maybe undertaken it with a little bit different balance than we have. Uh, but I think that balance is extremely important given the stress the entire community is under right now, as every community is under right now. And two is extremely important here, maintaining maximum flexibility for any possibility of both revenue and requirements and programming. As you heard with committee member Doherty's motion, we're learning additional requirements of our program at the same time uh, we're learning about the changes in the fiscal outlook. While we await those mandates, we need to maintain flexibility in everything that we do. And those are our guiding principles as we work to manage through this unprecedented situation. Ms. Turner? Some of the strategic steps taken to date. All employee groups were notified of potential reductions in force in accordance with contractual timelines. There were district-wide hiring, uh, district hiring freeze was enacted in April, resulting in flexibility and reductions of more than 50 positions. Transportation vendors were notified of the district's intent to enact a contractual provision halting payments during the closure period. This resulted in approximately $4 million in savings. Curriculum materials and technology were pre-purchased, utilizing the savings in FY20 to offset over $3 million of FY21 supply cost. Revolving accounts were replenished in FY20, enabling more than one million in additional offsets to fixed costs in FY21, including special ed out of district tuition. Federal ESSER CARES Act application, it will be submitted by June 30th with allowable recurring salary expenses, which offset operational costs in FY21 at more than $4 million. Central office administrators were notified of potential reductions in force, including specific positions totaling more than $1 million. Multiple budget possibilities have been developed and shared publicly since April, which contemplate different revenue scenarios to prepare the district in advance of the state's budget adoption. The most recent scenario of level funding was shared with the school committee on June 3rd and June 8th. Last, a 112th budget for the month of July 20th 
I mean, July 2020 was adopted by the school committee on June 8th, 2020. All right, so as we engage in this scenario-based planning, there's a process that we undertake as we work through these decisions. You may recall there was actually a speaker at our last meeting that asked that very question. How do you make decisions? Now, trying to describe that in one slide here, there's an old business adage from the 80s which speaks to the theory of action versus the theory in use. And what that suggests is that we need to be conscious not only of the correlation between what we say and what we do, but actually the correlation be behind the theory behind those differences. That actually if there's a difference between what we're saying and what we're doing, it makes complete sense because there's a difference in our theory behind what we say and our theory behind what we do. That's a conversation that we have internally throughout our planning to make sure that there's a, a correlation and alignment behind our theory of action, what we put forward in our strategic plan, and our theory in use where the budget plan is the plan for what we operationalize. Now our core beliefs and our fundamental commitments, while our actions may have to adjust, inevitably they're going to have to adjust as a result of this pandemic, we're never going to be adjusting on those core beliefs nor those fundamental commitments. And if you re remember, that fun those fundamental commitments were our definition, our local definition of equity. A lot of people, every school district at this point, I will say, speaks to equity. Very few actually define it. We took the added step within our strategic plan to have a committee adopted definition of equity that has us ensuring that we're committed to reducing and eliminating the achievement gaps, distributing resources in a way that's fair based on our students' needs, and serving our diverse comp population with courtesy, dignity, and respect in everything that we do. And we've also made sure through our new budgeting process at our school sites as well as our strategic planning process to make sure that we have family and community voice along the way. That becomes a challenge as fast as we're moving with limited information and it's important for us to remain conscious of the importance of family and community voice within our public school system. So we summarize that with one sentence and I apologize to all of our English teachers for my run-on sentence. Uh, it sometimes is difficult to try to add something in a sentence form uh, that is so complex. But our budget adjustments are contemplated based on plausible scenarios of revenue, which in totality honor the voices of the community, remain true to our core beliefs, deliver on our fundamental commitments, and continue to operationalize year one of the strategic plan, ensuring that good teaching happens for every child in every classroom every day. And you see the quotations around classroom. We don't know what our classrooms will be next year, but there will be classrooms of learning. All of our families had to recreate their dining rooms, their living rooms, their family rooms to create classrooms this year. And that still very well may be the scenario next year, but our work has to be about ensuring that good teaching happens for every child every day. Ms. Turner. To date, we have built out multiple scenarios, including the governor's initial, uh, initial proposed revenue figure, which was a plus 13.4 million. Then we did a level service budget, which reduced that original budget by 6.7 million. Then we tried a level funded budget, which was reducing the budget by 13.4 from the original, but that includes the 4.1 million of ESSER CARES Act funds. And now the last one we tried was a 5% reduction from the current year, which would result in $18.6 million reduction plus the $4.1 million of ESSER CARES Act funds. And so important to emphasize here, again, for the community, there are increased expenses. So even if we have a declining revenue, the amount that we would have to reduce is not simply a one-for-one -one with the amount of money that's reduced. We actually also have to account for the increased costs. So potential for future reductions, some of these we've already done. So we've already pre-purchased supplies and technology to offset the FY21 budget. We've already replenished the revolving accounts to offset the FY21 out of district cost. We've, reduced, we've co contemplated reducing administrative headcounts by $1 million. We have the Esther Kears Act Fund to offset the FY21 cost. We're doing that application now. These are some new ideas that we could consider. 
a facility lease termination, which would result in a savings of $420,000. We could further reduce the school site budgets up to $3.6 million. We could do district-wide furloughs up to $1.8 million. We could do district-wide pay freezes up to $4 million. We could have program realignment up to $2 million pending further analysis. We have to review that. Or, last but not least, we could have a reduction in force. Yeah, so I want to make sure that we can highlight here. We know this committee uh, and this entire community's goal is to make sure that we re eliminate the possibility for layoffs, if at all possible. That may not be at all possible. Once you start digging this deeply into the costs here, we are an organization that employs people to serve people. That's where our dollars are. There are limited options outside of people depending on where the revenue comes in. There's a, here when you're looking at the reduction in school site budgets, again, we've heard from the committee, heard from the community, that's the last place we want to go. Again, the bulk of, that's where the bulk of the committee's budget is, is within the school site budgets. This number reflects two things. One, we increased or plan to increase school site budgets by $2 million. So if you bring them back to level, meaning you would have a reduction overall in the district, but no reduction in school sites, you then account, still account for $2 million. The additional percentage here is to say, if you reduce school budgets by 1%, so if you have to contemplate a reduction district-wide of 5%, to get up to that dollar amount without touching schools would near impossible. So this dollar amount suggests the two million added, meaning the schools didn't have it last year, it was an additional two million that was planned for because we thought we had a better fiscal outlook. And then 1% and what you would look at there, that uh, we still plan again and hearing from the committee to make sure we're empowering our leaders, our teachers, our parents to be involved in what that looks like at their school communities. But you got, we have to work from some type of scenario. And that's, that's where you get those dollar amounts. Program realignment, uh, still pending analysis because we have to go through what that would actually mean. But again, if you realign programs at cost savings, that's less services that we're providing. This district's budget is extremely lean and extremely tight. There is no good decision to be made here. These are gonna be the best of a series of bad possibilities. With this tonight, it's not to say we're ready to give you specifics, but instead being transparent with the community that if it gets to the point of a 5% reduction, which is $18 million in cuts to costs, this is the type of thing that we're gonna to have to be working through as a community. What are our next steps? We could run the fair student funding algorithm to review the school site budgets to make reductions in an equitable manner. We could have the school site councils work to make such cuts as a team. We could prepare and submit the Esser Cares Act application before June 30th. We've already pre-purchased supplies, but we'll continue to do that when we have the ability to do so. And we can run projections to strategically utilize as much of FY20 savings as possible to offset FY21. One example is we usually charge the use of facilities revolving accounts um, for custodial you know, use of facilities. Well, we charge the use of facilities revolving account. We reversed that charge and had it hit the local budget. So now we can carry the revolving funds forward. So that's one example of just strategically thinking of um, possible savings. The timeline, we have to close out current year purchase orders, we have to complete year-end transfers, complete the ESSER CARES Act application and submit prior to June 30th, we have to close out the FY20 budget year, we have to wait for the grant applications and um, allocations, July 1st we'll start with the 112th budget, July school committee meeting, we can potentially vote on an August 112th budget if we still haven't heard any data on um, our revenue. Hopefully, we'll receive revenue <coughs> figures from the state. Um, we'll update the budget to reflect state revenue figures. We'll schedule a finance subcommittee meeting to present updated budget, and then we'll finalize and approve the updated budget. Three questions that I have. Uh, is there any additional information that would be helpful to the committee? Are there additional analysis the committee would like us to consider? 
Are there additional planning steps between now and the final budget adoption that the committee would like us to take? Mr. Mayor, that concludes the presentation. We'll stand for committee questions. Sure. Anybody have questions? Sure, Ms. Martin. I just have a couple quick, uh, quick ones. Uh, one, I know you mentioned the pre-purchasing, so that, um, and I know you're in the process right now trying to determine of what may still be left that we may be able to spend. I know you're in the process. Do you have any, you know, kind of ballpark of what we may still have available to us from the different accounts? Actually, we have been doing projections all along to make sure that we yep. utilize and replenish the revolving accounts pre-spend, I mean pre-purchase the 2.4 million in technology, right. 600,000 in supplies and text, and then we did 350,000 for the school site general supply accounts. So we've done, and then like I said, the use of facilities idea was a recent one that's part of the transfer that you see in front of you today. Um, with all that, we think that we're down to within, it was, we had millions. And right. we're down to within, like, um, um, even if purchase orders are canceled at the last minute, which we have no knowledge of, we asked, do you need this? They, we've asked them to review several times, but we would be within $100,000 um, surplus. And that's with us having exhausted everything because we've already gone past the, um, the deadline for spending. So as of the date of, you know, the last day of spending, we thought mm -hmm. we would have nothing left. We thought after replenishing everything and doing everything that we had done, we wouldn't have anything. But now we're seeing that there might be $100,000 in unused PD. Mm -hmm. The schools might not use their PD funds to do year-end um, professional development, mm -hmm. things like that. But we're, we're not going to leave millions on the table. Uh, to get it down to 100000 I think, is really impressive. I mean, that's, that's a very tight right under the line. So thank you for that. I think that's great. Um, my, and my other question on the, the, I think it's listed in here is 50 positions that basically, and, and I think we're somewhere between 50 and 57, positions that basically as, as a result of the hiring freeze, these positions simply weren't filled this year and won't be filled next year. There is, um, it gives you flexibility for which ones won't be filled because essentially, yes. And so we're not seeing that $4 million yet? That's, that's correct. You're gonna, that'll be for next year, yeah. Okay, so that, that's still in the kind of things we can do as we move forward. We'd still have that $4 million to kind of... If you've got that, if you've got that flexibility, uh, those would be... Uh, there's even more positions than that. That number is around teaching positions. So you actually have... We haven't hired any external people into the organization absent the couple of positions that we have as exceptions. Yeah. Uh, so that number and those position numbers are growing. What we'll have to do, the next step is once we know our scenario, academic scenario uh, for next year, we're going to have to open up and hire some of them. So you won't have all of them, but it gives you flexibility for sure as a committee. But it's still on the table. I that's, think right. that's great. Thank you. Sure, Ms. Clark. I just have a comment. I just want to say that I'm very grateful and appreciative of the hard work that you all are doing, and um, I appreciate how responsive you all have been to our requests and our questions and ideas. Um, I'm certainly no expert in how to run a school or uh, get through a day to day. Um, and I think that's what all of you are here for, all of our leaders and our, our folks at the schools, our leaders at the schools and teachers. And so I do appreciate how, um, you know, I think that the budget hearing that we went through last week, I, I agree with my colleague in saying it was extremely inefficient. I really like the ideas that I see here. I think you even heard some of what we were asking there. Um, and put it into some of the ideas really being forthcoming about the planning and thinking. And I see it, that as a productive way to move forward. Um, what we did the other night, I don't see that as a productive way. And I just wanted to uh, say that, again, I really appreciate how, how you are being responsive and hearing what the concerns we're raising are um, and then incorporating them into the, to the next presentation. Um, so I wanted to say thank you. Uh, any other comments? Mr. Howie? Yeah, just second that. I'll just, oh, is, was that a motion, what you just did? Uh, no, I'm just sorry. comments. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, Ms. Darney. Uh, thank you, Ron. So um, I think this is all very helpful information. I guess my question really speaks to the report that's coming later this evening about the task force. And have we thought about, in terms of what supplies, and, and I know Ms. Martinette mentioned how much have we spent down that money, 
what if the task force comes up with, whether it's the hybrid model or the additional supplies that we will need, given that we don't really know what our environment is going to be in the fall, have we got some flexibility to go back or to add to some of those supply things that we're purchasing? We have the flexibility. At this point, anything that we add to the expense side, that was a, it's going to be additional reduction someplace else. An example, though, is remember at our last conversation, we had a placeholder of about 600000 in the uh, for PPE. Our now analysis is that's probably closer to $2 million with what we're hearing. But again, with your motion, those things could ultimately not find their way here. They're just sounding like they're finding their way here now. We're going to continue to have to do that analysis. Um, they work hand in hand. Our, our model for our schools will, will mimic how we're going to be funding our schools. So we're doing both in parallel now, and ultimately they're going to come together as being one plan for next year. Okay. Um, with no further questions, I just have one comment. Um, now that things have changed uh, statewide with the busing contract, um, I just want to make sure we're in some sort of negotiation for what may come up uh, cost-wise. And I know that it uh, uh, depends on approval of the uh, city council, the auditor, and the school committee, but I know that calls have been made, right? So can you just, you don't have to go into detail, but just let us know what might be happening with that. Yeah, I can provide you, in short, the uh, question that Committee Member Martin uh, had about the savings and how they've been deployed and then the answer on that. That's where the, that's the bulk of those savings, if you recall. There were two large line items for services not rendered during the point of closure because of the unexpected closure and the length of that closure. One was the transportation and the other was substitutes. Those were your two big line items. Uh, those savings have been redeployed uh, in ways to offset costs for next year. Uh, the largest line item that you may remember that the committee approved was the purchase of Chromebooks, moving to a one-to-one -one district so quickly, over $2 million of Chromebooks were purchased. That then comes to committee member Doherty, offsetting not only the costs that are within your current budget, but offsetting the additional costs that we can reasonably assess are, neat, are there. Uh, Chromebooks are there. So that savings have already been deployed. So what you would then look for and what the committee would then have to look at, again, is increasing your expense line. So if you increase the expense line, that would then be further reductions to next year's budget in order to account for that. Uh, so there is a, uh, the legal change, if you remember the last time, as the mayor's pointing out, uh, the committee was not legally authorized with uh, committee member Hoey's motion. There was, not a, there was no allowance for the committee to even consider paying transportation vendors for services not rendered. Now, if the committee wanted to consider that, you could consider that as a committee. The message we've heard clearly from the committee prior was that that was not an interest of the full committee. So we haven't moved in a direction of uh, bringing anything back to the committee, but we can if the committee so desires. It would be an added expense, though, that we would then have to reduce further. And right now, every expense is in the form of the non-negotiable that we put forward, which was to try to eliminate, minimize layoffs to all extent possible. Uh, we're no longer going to be able to hold to zero layoffs, so it'll just increase that line, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Sure, Ms. Darney. Just a couple of quick questions. I want to make sure my numbers, I'm remembering them. So I know it was $4 million in savings from uh, bus transportation that did not take place. What was the amount of savings in the substitute teacher line? Do you remember what that was? Approximately 350000 Okay. And then our increased, is it health insurance? Are those one of the fixed costs that's going up? What is that going up for next year? Uh, over a million dollars. And and the salary increases is $5.4 million? Is that right? Okay. So $1 million in health care, $5.4 million in pay raises or step increases. Um, those are the only major fixed costs that are going up. We've also included in there $2 million because the school site budgets were released to schools, including $2 million, so we have to account for that, right. that now. So you have that $2 million. And then the other increase that we've placed in that is the COVID-related expenses, which are uh, now we're assessing could be at least $2 million. The last time you saw that line item, it was 600000 That one's going up. 
Thank you. Chairman Mr. Stowey? <clears throat> yes, me. I think uh, the busing issue, you better keep your eyes open on it because I'm a little concerned if we do go back to school, uh, are we going to have buses for the kids? Um, and this is my feeling. That's why I thought we should have, I tried to bring it up to pay the bus companies at that time, and then I found out we don't have the power to do that. But at the same time, I knew we hired a new bus company in the past few years, and they have a big overhead. They have car payments and insurance payments, and I knew they were probably in trouble. And I'm not sure they didn't do too much complaining. I pay attention to most things like this, and I haven't heard them complaining. And I just want you to keep your eyes open. It's a bigger issue than I think we're talking about right now. Busing could be a, a problem for us if we open up full blast this September. Right. A couple of weeks ago, the state made a decision for the state. They passed um, some legislation which wasn't in effect prior, and now it is. So, okay. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, do you want to go to the return to school task force? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So these two sh will co come together. Right now we're still going through scenario-based planning. It's not as easy to line them up one for one, but uh, the committee should, uh, in typical sequence, we probably should hear about the scenario that you're going to be implementing and then the budget. Uh, just keep in mind that uh, these will ultimately come together at the end once we get clarity. But Dr. Guillory and uh, Ms. Desmond and our principals have been facilitating uh, work groups that include parents and teachers and support staff. Uh, a big uh, thank you to Kate McLaughlin, um, Matt Stahl, Liam Skinner, and Wendy Roberge, who have been taking the direct leadership around three different scenarios. A scenario uh, where we're back fully on campus. Even if we come back fully on campus where school looks like it used to look, there's no coming back from a pandemic without some differences for kids that we have to address. So even talking about a full on-campus model uh, is gonna require us to have some different scenario planning than what we had in place for school opening this year. There is no just repeating what we did in prior years. Then we have the other scenario where perhaps there's another surge of uh, COVID-19 and we're in remote learning in the fall. Again, um, we feel really good about the work that everyone did to redesign this entire system over the course of essentially a weekend from the time of closure to moving from traditional learning to virtual learning, but there's a lot learned from that. There was a lot learned from that and taking that learning and putting it into place in a scenario of uh, full remote learning for next year is another group. And then the third is a group that says perhaps we might have elements of each on campus and remote. We're calling that a hybrid model. Now, in addition to the fact that we need a model to open school, we also have learned through the course of this pandemic that we have the need to be flexible and nimble, that we may need to flex across models at any given time. Uh, many of you remember it was an evolving determination when we made the decision to close schools, and we closed schools prior to the state closing schools and how that evolved so quickly. So we need these models at our fingertips because we don't know the world we're heading into when we open school and we need to be honest and transparent about that with our community. There's, uh, so Dr. Guillory, Ms. Desmond, can you share the current planning? We'll have more details again. We'll continue to update the committee on this as well as we go forward. Thank you, Dr. Board. <clears throat> and I think that was an excellent executive summary of what you were actually going to see here. So that was the en entire presentation. Next slide. <laughs> we you are all set. We'll, we'll we'll go. We'll move quickly. Um, so as Dr. Boyd shared, um, we want to begin by just thanking all of the folks who, with whom we've shared with you, who's actually on the committee in name. But there are um, an ex there's an extensive network of people beyond who's actually sitting on the committees that are doing readings, uh, providing input to the to the facilitators and those. So we want to say thank you to those folks as well. Next slide. So our task force um, phase one objective, so we're looking at this uh, essentially in three phases. Phase one is sort of 
the big level planning that we're, the big level thinking that we're presently engaged in. Phase two will be uh, over the summer where we drill down deeper to get ready for opening, and then certainly phase three will be the actual opening uh, in the fall, whatever model that we choose. So the idea here is to look at, uh, discuss and make general recommendations for further planning uh, in the areas of teaching and learning all the way through extracurricular activities uh, in each of these models. Um, and then for phase two, we're going to expand um, upon this work, engage some different sets of eyes to take the, the planning a little bit deeper. So just a, a brief uh, timeline of where we are in phase one, June 2nd, we actually launched this, timeline, uh, this task force. Um, and now we're sitting um, here in the middle where we're giving, providing this initial update to the school committee. Uh, we were expecting some guidance, or we're anticipating guidance from the state at any time. We were expecting that on the 15th, um, but it's not here as of yet. So as soon as that um, um, information comes out, our task force will adjust their planning. And as Dr. Boyd said, it's important for us to have all three of these, even if the state is recommending one for the fall, depending on the, how the pandemic or the virus moves, that will allow us flexibility and nimbleness to move into our other plans. Uh, and so we wanna make sure that we have um, that, um, that flexibility with the idea that we have recommendations and guidance um, by the end of June. The full in-person task force is being led by Principal uh, Roberge at the Pine Arts. Uh, the members uh, are listed here of that particular um, subgroup, um, as well as some central office supports. The progress at this point um, is that the subgroups have been studying various um, school and corporate reopening plans. They're looking at the the DESE guidance that's out there, and we understand that the guidance that we presently have for summer school is not an automatic extrapolation into the fall, so we don't want to set that, that false precedent, but it gives us some idea of, of what, uh, how DESE is thinking a little bit. And um, they're working within their existing networks to expand ideas at present. This particular subgroup is up to an 18-page analysis of, of their thinking of what uh, an in-school model will look like. And certainly not to say that it's all uh, exhaustive in that regard, but again, the idea is what are the big rocks that we need to be thinking about and how do we plan for those? Um, and then certainly, how do we keep our kids safe? So how do we make sure that the schooling that we provide for them is also of educational benefit, so running the safety aspect of it, but also the educational uh, benefit. What uh, the group wants to look at further is uh, certainly uh, when looking at whether or not it's feasible to return to in-person, how is the virus, uh, virus continuing to be transmitted in the state, uh, certainly looking at the cost, um, what, what will that um, look like, uh, how do we maintain our levels of PPE, given that it's gonna be needed across the state and across the country. How do we um, institute instructional best practices? And then how do we, again, will um, serve our community in the best way possible in an in-person setting? Uh, the hybrid scenario uh, took into consideration um, similar um, items from what we had already established uh, when school closed at the beginning of the closure with using some of the platforms and some of the curriculum um, models along with um, what it would look like if there was uh, a partial return to school. Uh, the members of the committee are listed here of the subgroup, and you'll notice that uh, we tried to have a cross-section of every school represented in all of these task force. Uh, so uh, you'll see some teachers representing some various schools, some parents representing uh, different schools, so that we could make sure that we had the voice uh, of all of our schools represented in some one of these subgroups. Uh, so if you look at uh, the progress to date with the hybrid scenario, they are looking at uh, the week on, week off model, which has been re uh, 
mentioned um, by members of the Department of Ed as a possibility, uh, looking at when some, school, some students are in school, other students are perhaps home, extending the learning that they had had from the week prior. Uh, they're looking at chunking out curriculum in two-week um, pieces and um, flexibility around uh, instruction with both in-person activities and also remote activities. They're also looking at how uh, to facilitate in an effective way synchronous learning activities between in-person and remote learners. Some of the questions that they are looking at for uh, further discussion is how to support staff, um, both uh, teacher, uh, teachers and also both paras and tutors who support the instructional work within our classrooms. Uh, how to go back to using uh, schools, even if it's temporarily. Um, what, what would transportation costs look like? Uh, some of the health risks involved with having students uh, walking or cycling to school, et cetera. Uh, and what, to what extent might we differentiate for uh, the different groups? So they're looking at would our younger students benefit from being in school full time while maybe there is more independent work for students that are possibly older and able to sustain that for longer periods of time. So those are all of the, the things that they're looking at currently. Uh, as far as the remote subgroup, and as Dr. Boyd said, we've learned a lot from some of the remote work that we've already done this year. Um, again, the group you'll see represents different schools than perhaps we had seen in some of the other subgroups so that we're sure that we have the voice of all. We also have technology integration specialists on all of the committees. We have a representation from our special education department as well as our curriculum department. The progress to date here is really looking at consistency around scheduling for all students in, in what they participate in in home. Um, they want to ensure that there is time on learning happening for all students, both in the elementary and the middle levels. Um, they're looking at consistency around instructional platforms. Um, that is something that we've learned, uh, that having uh, varying platforms may not be as effective as it would be if we had very specific platforms for our early childhood, early education students, and then our older students in the um, higher elementary and secondary grades. And uh, consistent curriculum being pushed out from the curriculum office, which is, is something that we did uh, do this year, and we did find that that um, was very supportive of uh, what was happening in our schools. Uh, and then continue with the Lowell Public School library of successful remote learning lessons and projects. That's something we had created this year uh, in the spring when we knew that remote learning was, going, was here to stay. We started to develop a teacher library that we could continually put resources into and teachers could um, draw from for their, week, for their daily and weekly lessons. So we would want to expand upon that. And then um, just making sure that there's the professional development necessary for our, for our teachers um, on the new platforms or the platforms that we decide to um, keep consistent within the school system. Some questions that they're looking at for further discussion. Again, cost effectiveness. Um, what programs and curricula do we need to invest in, which I, I know was mentioned earlier here. Uh, what's the best way to support parents, guardians, child care providers during remote learning? So many of our students are not at home when they're, when they're not in school, and so how do we provide support so that everyone who's working with our students outside of school can support them? Uh, and then uh, looking at a flexibility around staffing. So the, that is uh, the two other scenarios that we're looking at along with in-person. And then our high school is mimicking the same um, task force subgroups, but they're doing it all at the high school level. So the um, high school timeline is there. It's very similar to our um, elementary and middle school task force timelines. Uh, there's a listing of the representatives from the different departments at the high school who are on the task force. And the high school is, is looking at uh, refining and translating a family survey to see what worked well, what didn't work well, and what we should be focusing on for all of the possible scenarios. They're also looking at the Department of Ed guidance as it's coming out. 
and aligning the scenario plans to the ones that our elementary and middle school folks are working on currently. So we do have um, Dr. McLaughlin, who's coordinating all of these task forces, does bring everyone together remotely through Zoom so that we can all have these conversations around what's happening in each of these task force at all of the levels so that we're, we're constantly communicating and staying apprised of what's happening. Uh, so that's what's happening in phase one. They will take the recommendations and questions and start to shift to phase two. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? Sure, Mr. Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in, in all of the discussions that has been taking place with the task forces, um, I have concerns with the fact that the kids have lost several months of ed education from, say, the end of their second grade, then they're going into third grade, and teachers are, who are third grade teachers have an expectation of what the kids should know coming into third grade, which they didn't get in these last three months. So my concern is, are the curriculums all going to be readjusted in order for our kiddos to just continue basically where they left off, kind of. I know that there were enrichment issues and, and some things, some learning was taking place, I know. But I think at the end of the day, I think a lot was lost, an awful lot was lost. And I think we need to keep that in mind going forward that it, like that little fourth grader going into a fifth grade has only two thirds of, this, of what he should have or she should have had uh, to prepare for fifth grade. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm wondering if that has been in, included in that. Yes, so the, um, the curriculum team actually um, redesigned the curriculum maps for the spring based on the closure. Um, and we're also looking at um, what, and the, that redesign was not only, that was something that the curriculum team did, but then also we started getting information from the state. And so we were making sure that our changes were aligned to, to what the Department of Ed was expecting, and it, they were. Uh, so we have taken into consideration some of the standards that may not have been fully implemented or taught at all in the spring, and those will be reincorporated into uh, adjusted curriculum maps for the fall. So that is something that we're already working on. Uh, that's, that is uh, a, different from what the task force is doing, but all of this work will come together. So transportation costs, um, task force uh, plans, what we're doing in the curriculum office, it will all come together. And so the way that these task force are set up is there's expert groups. Um, and so when the task force comes to a particular area that they um, need guidance or advice on, they contact the expert group. And so there's expert groups in all of these areas, such as curriculum, transportation, facilities. Um, and so they lean on those uh, members at that time to have further guidance in the planning stages. If that makes sense. Thank you. I knew you would be on top of that. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Joe, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to see that there's a survey planned for family input. I think that where we can keep uh, that school community voice, you know, uh, in the decision making process with regard to both the school budget and the return to school, I think that's really important. I think where possible, if we can incorporate student voice into that as well and feedback, I think our students would be able to provide some, some really valuable feedback on what worked and what didn't. So I think just involving them where we can. Um, I also am happy to see the consistent platform and my request as a parent would be, I'm very interested in a platform that can in, um, incorporate two-way communication within the platform uh, for families to be able to review and see how our students are doing and be able to communicate directly with teachers through, um, through the platform itself. Um, because I know as a parent, I was asking my daughter how things were going, um, but not really able to see it you know, as clearly as I would like. Um, so, and then my last, my question is, um, how are the three groups at this point working together, or are they? Because I heard you say that they're, we're looking to be very nimble next year with perhaps needing to go from one to another. And um, yeah, what, what's the plan if there's, if there's something already happening, or what's the plan for those three to kind of be working interchangeably? Thank you. So actually, that's um, by design. That's how we set the task force up. So Dr. McLaughlin is the convener of the group. 
uh, and each um, she's meeting with the leads as well so that there's this cross-pollination or cross-talk that's happening between the task force. So a perfect example would be if there is a um, uh, one of the digital platforms that's being used, we want to make sure that that platform, and let's just say Google Classroom at this point, if Google Classroom is, uh, if we start with that in the fall as a hybrid model, then we'll make sure that that's a viable option for our in-person model as well as for our full remote model so that there's this seamless transition that will happen. So for example, if we were to close, if we start off in person and we were to close on a Friday, on Monday we would be able to pick up and continue um, with that level of learning. So that sync that we're, we're building that in by design into the, into the models. Mr. Howie? Yeah, I'm really impressed by this whole task force stuff. Um, the thing I would wanna know is when you're leading a task force like that, like Dr. McLaughlin, um, I, li I would like almost like a spotlight on excellence to have her in front of us to maybe tell us some of the things that might have happened. Did everybody participate? Did everybody, because it always seems to be the best, the, I've seen all the names, and it seems like it's always those same principles over and over and over. So being a school committee person, I would love to hear someone like Dr. McLaughlin give us an overall picture of what that was like to run that task force. Um, I don't believe we'll hear many negative things, but if someone wasn't participating, and she's not going to give up somebody's name, but she might say a few people weren't helping out, like returning their emails or something like that, because I think this is one of the best things I've seen. We have some great principals, and their ideas are probably going to push us ahead to put students in front of teachers faster than in any city in the state of Mass. That's what I'm hoping for. So nice job. Nice job. Thank you. Any, Ms. Darney? I think you're in a It's clearly uh, just a daunting task that our staff are facing. And look, and I think the way it was set up, I want to thank you both for, or whoever is responsible for this report, you know, to have the questions as a separate sheet, because certainly, from my mind, looking at all that we're facing, there are so many questions. Um, like, for example, with the the hybrid model that you're, you know, in A and then B, you're remote. Is this based on using the same staff? Are we going to be increasing staff a huge amount? I mean, all these factors I imagine need to be looked at. How are we going to? How do you have a classroom teacher? and then somebody handling the other half that are doing it remotely the same week. Um, so I just, I think it's huge, what, it, unprecedented, but thank you. Sure, Mr. Howie. Yeah, one more thing that I forgot. When, when we're virtually teaching children at home, and I'm only going off experience because I see my grandchildren a lot, one that has special ed or special needs, it's not helped him at all. The, and then the nine-year-old, he's having an easy time. I have a neighbor that has a deaf kid, something as small as that, having a hard time hearing at home. So the little issues bother me, to be honest with you, but special ed has to be a very big part of that virtual learning. And, and I'm talking smart. I know some kids at straight A's that are having a difficult time at home learning on computers. So we have to be careful of that also. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. All right, personnel report, Mr. Superintendent. Thank you. This is just a standard report that is submitted uh, to the committee. Dr. Hall's available if there's any questions. Okay. Um, report on motions. 641, a response to motion um, by Mr. Hoey. Mr. Howie, any questions on your response? No, I haven't really seen um, that, that update about special ed. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> that, the super, that the superintendent produce a report by April 1st to meet the following information, charting out spent, uh, spent expenditures by the year. Uh, for the last 15 years, or as far as possible. 
Um, so it talks about the number on total special education budget, uh, uh, amount of money spent on district services, number of employees working in spe special education, total number of employees within the district. So that was the motion. I haven't seen any paperwork on that myself personally. I don't know if it wasn't just put in my packet or not. Is Actually, you're right. It's not in the. There's um. Okay. Well, I'll have to delay and uh, make some comments about it next time because I didn't read that or see it. But I want to thank you for uh, going back that many years. If you did, uh, just to give people an idea of how special ed is growing and where we have to have concerns, that's all. So I'm sorry. I, you notice I don't have my packet in front of me? My wife's car wouldn't start and I left them in her car and came down here basically with a computer with 13% power left on it, so I'm sorry. But I will read that report and thank you very much. I was more concerned tonight about Mr. Dillon's motion anyway, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, next is the motion response by Mr. Dillon requests superintendent provide the update on the Cregan TV studio. Mr. Dillon, do you have any questions on your report or? Uh, no, just a few comments. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, the report itself is uh, setting the bar for reports in the future because it was impressive. Um, uh, I mean, it looked great. Graphic design was amazing. Um, and so I, I got to give Brian Wilkins credit for that. Um, the, it, was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Very detailed. Um, it's like, it's as if he had already had it written or already, already had this work already done. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so I, I was happy about, uh, about a lot of things in the report. Uh, the fact that the Raider report is produced daily still, I, I was not even... Uh, I was not even aware that that was, you know, kept up with the way the way that it is. Um, you know, one of the glaring things is the staffing needs, um, and I think you know I think we're aware that um, our you know our staff has been cut over the last few years in there, and and, and we've we've had sort of a skeleton crew running what's um, what's going on in there, and it's unfortunate. Um, you know, so I wanted to you know really bring this up. Um, because I think you know it should be happening anyway, um, but on you know on top of the fact uh, that we're using technology so um, so often and it's such a, a huge part of what we're doing right now, um, and and you can even read you know in the report itself, um, Mr. Wilkins talks about how he's been supporting the staff, um, you know, and, it, and it's an important part of, of remote learning, uh, but it's also an important part of our kids' future and um, uh, producing video content is going to be a huge thing for our kids um, in their lifetime. It already is. Um, and so if we can, uh, you know, in, encourage that, um, the conversation around producing o online content as well, um, because you get into talking about social media, how to handle social media, um, and how to use it to your advantage and how to use it for good. Um, and, you know, I, so I think those are all really important conversations that we just need to keep in this technology loop that, that we, um, uh, you know, one thing we are spending on now is technology. Um, and, I, and I think we should really keep focus on this um, moving forward and also transition it well into the new building um, and make sure that it, you know, um, video production is, it continues to be a part of what we're doing and we really support that whole program. Um, one thing that I, I thought was awesome in the report that I, you know, I just touched on the social media thing, but maybe Mr. Superintendent, um, why, you know, can we stream, uh, you know, on YouTube? Can we, can we allow that to happen? I mean, I know, is it as simple as our firewall at school doesn't allow access, so that's been uh, an obstacle, or is it, um, because I feel, you know, I think in the report it mentions that we're paying for streaming services on a website, um, and I really think we can take advantage of, it's free. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is free to post video out there, and, and, and there are a lot of easy ways to do that. So it seems silly to me. Uh, I'm not sure exactly the details behind it, but is it as easy as access to those websites uh, at school? 
I'm going to have to look into sure. that to, to get a, okay. an accurate answer. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I mean, that could alleviate a lot of issues and um, sa save us a lot of money there as well. Um, but thank you for the report. Um, I'd really like to, to stay on top of it and, and keep talking about that. Um, the, the whole concept itself, but um, keeping that stu studio going is um, something I'm, I'm, I feel strongly about. Brian Wilkins is a great example. Uh, there are a lot of people around my age. Uh, I, I get into Lowell High in 1998, I walked in there and everything, the, all the TVs were, it was crazy back then that we had a TV in every classroom. Uh, we were ahead of the curve and I know a lot of people, including Mr. Wilkins himself, I'm sure, that are in that industry. Um, they have either been involved in television or radio or, um, and, and I think we, we lose that when we, when we don't pay attention to it. So thank you. Mr. Howie and then Ms. Martin. Yeah, um, about a quarter century ago, exactly I think, 25 years ago, I happened to be on a school committee that created that uh, studio, TV studio in the high school. It wasn't my idea, I just happened to be on that uh, particular school committee. But um, I like what Mr. Dillon's talking about getting it online because we have channel, in Lowell, like LTC, you got channel 8, channel 95, and channel 99. And all I would like to see for starters is to get channel 22 in there because you can be anywhere in the world and just hit ltc.com and it'll come up and you can watch. So I think what Mr. Dillon's looking for is probably a little bit more than I'm looking for, but I would like to get that out online. I think it's a great thing for students and it's the time of the year to do that. It's the time to do it. Ms. Martin. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I agree with Mr. Dillon. It's an exceptionally well done report and I appreciate the time and effort that went into it from Mr. Wilkins. Uh, I did have one question regarding the RFP that has been posted to uh, try and support this additional, um, you know, stipends for students so that they could get what I'm assuming is kind of a, a, an accredited uh, certificate um, kind of imprimatur from the, from the uh, program and then be able to be paid a stipend when they're covering uh, student events. Um, it says it's been posted. I'm curious where that's been posted and it, a timeline for when we'd expect to hear back on it. Ms. Desmond, do you have that information? You've got it. I will get the answer to that question and get back to you okay. for the next meeting. Because the other thing, just sure. ensuring that it's like shared with, I'm assuming, I mean, but shared with Project Learn, that could be a great area for them to offer support in trying to, to seek out and solicit some supporting funding for it. Thank you. Ms. Phillips, do you have information to share? Yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, school committee members, um, the RFP was released by the city on June 6th. Um, is open for two weeks, um, so it will be closing on, I believe, the 20th. And then the, um, those who submitted bids, um, those bids will be reviewed and then, um, you know, a uh, recipient will be identified. So it's a, it's a bid to, to garner funds so that we can then pay students, is that? Um, it's a sponsorship bid to um, post a logo on the side of the van and then the funding would be used to support the okay, students. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Mr. Hardy, do you have a question? Mr. Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I too would like to uh, thank Mr. Dillon for putting, uh, putting that motion in and, and the great response that he got uh, on it. Uh, endlessly, I have been asking for uh, the school system to advertise better all of the wonderful things that we do in this district. Uh, and what better way than to have the TV studio available to do that and, and putting it out there? Uh, because most of the people that live here and have lived here forever don't know how great this system is and how great the, te the teachers are, how great our kids are. I really, I, I, I'm going to say this out in public because I am very upset with Lowell Sun because almost four months of school pages on the, in the Sunday paper, not one mention of anything in Lowell. In four months. 
that's unconscionable in my book. Something has to be done. Either, uh, either someone from our district is not submitting information or it's just being ignored. And either one of those are not acceptable in my book. We need to let people know what we're doing here and not just on the, the hundreds of thousands of people watching tonight. That, that has to be something we have to address. So thank you. Okay, so Mr. Dakota, it's not the former. So there is a lot of information uh, being provided and submitted. Uh, I do biweekly meetings with the uh, beat writer, one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings. I uh, did offer up a year in review meeting with the editorial board. I'm still, still waiting on a response to that. And uh, I did draft a full op-ed that Ms. Phillips uh, shared with them that was, that was ready to go that discussed some of the scenario-based planning uh, that was done in anticipation for closing the year so that we could ease some anxiety for families that are obviously feeling some of the anxiety. Um, we've definitely provided information, shared information, and uh, you offer a, a point of privilege here to also say uh, that the spotlights are something that's necessary and we haven't been able to be in person, but I want to recognize that today was supposed to be the time where we celebrate our retirees Usually we do that, you do that with a spotlight, you do that with a, uh, a nice reception. We're gonna do that when we're allowed to come back in person in some way. So we're planning to do that in July. So our retirees that are listening, the school committee did not, uh, did not miss you, quite the opposite. They wanna make sure that they can recognize you the way you should be recognized for the accomplishment of your career. Uh, and we're gonna hope to do that in July, uh, Mr. Dakota. So those spotlights, there's lots of them that we can do. And once we can start spotlighting people again in person, we'll start bringing those back. But if the committee wants to do it virtually for some of these, we can certainly do that too. Joe, Mr. Dillon. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, just to, I guess, clean up at the end of that. Uh, I know, you know, some of the information in the report talked about staffing and needs for technology and we're, that conversation, you know, probably not the place to have it, not the time to have it, excuse me, uh, right now where, you know, the budget is so crazy, but let's keep that in mind. I mean, uh, he's, he has some great suggestions on what staff is necessary, and looking at the dates, I mean, 97 is, is when some of the technology is from, which is just silly. Um, so let's keep this in the front of our mind, please. please. Um, but also just the streaming and... Um, the streaming thing, if you could look into that for me, because that could be a simple solution that helps that program immediately um, using on you know different online websites. Ms. Phillips, can you take that note? That might be something that uh, Jeffrey can resolve very quickly for us. Uh, perhaps that's a conversation. That could be a case, uh, Mr. Dillon, where perhaps he got an answer from the technology office and vetting it through our sure, communications that's might give a might be able to get us to an, an easier answer, so. Great. Uh, you know. And then just the other thing would be um, looking, looking more into private partnerships, maybe. Um, I, I know we work with Comcast, um, you know, to make this happen as it is, we get money through them. Uh, it would be a really interesting uh, partnership to have with a Google, I mean, where they help us out with our technology side and producing content. Uh, and we're, we supply them with skilled workers. I mean, or, you know, there are a lot of benefits that they could have out of it. The Google television, you know, we're certainly not going to make it that. But you know, um, we could, you know, we could we could partner that way, the same way that we do with Comcast. Um, and I think it could benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sure, Mr. Dakota. This is your second time. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would be remiss if I did not also compliment Mr. Wilkins who I think does a phenomenal job in TV studios. Just had, I had to throw that in. I'm sorry I left that out the last time. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to add a comment, too. I thought this was a great report. Um, I did also, could you just follow up, Mr. Superintendent, on what Mr. Dillon said, but also um, could we just get a little more detail on um, uh, what the staffing needs really should be? Because in my eyes and probably the committee's eyes too, that um, I think they had four people over there and it's cut down to one. I think at a minimum, um, we sh really should have two people over there. If there's 
um, a way to make that adjustment this year. It just we're doing a disservice by by understaffing it. So if we can at least bring it to par, um, that's what they need over there. It's in my eyes. So if we could we just get a, <clears throat> a follow-up report on that? Yeah, Miss Miss Desmond, can you take that note? Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? One quick thing. How many Mayor. times did you speak? I spoke once. Okay. I just spoke Mr. once. Uh, I think you got to remember when Mr. Dillon said it's been 1997, because that's the year I got off the school committee, and all that technology is that old. And before we thinking about maybe hiring, I'm just saying fix the equipment, because it's really almost useless, I believe. I'm not sure if it's that bad or not. You're down there. But I'm hearing it's basically yeah, we'll, useless. We'll get a report. Okay. I thought we had been updating some of it, but I know the staffing is... You know, I know that's a problem, too, Mayor. Real problem, yeah. I think the equipment so. is, might be worse. That's all I'm saying. 1997 was a great year. That was my high school graduation year. Uh, but it wasn't a great year for technology. I, I, I remember the, the year quite well. So I'm, I'm definitely with you, Mr. Howe. Thank you. All right, I need a motion to accept the reports for Superintendent 61 through 64.2 by Mr. Howe, seconded by Mr. Dakota. All those in favor? Uh, new business, uh, vote on, the, accept the donation of the Bailey School from HubSpot, Mr. Superintendent. Yeah, the, this is a, a matter of, uh, of procedure here. Uh, so uh, donation, Ms. Desmond can provide you an update on uh, what the donation is, and then these donations come to the committee for approval. Uh, but Ms. Desmond. Thank you, um, Superintendent Boyd. A um, teacher at the um, Bailey School, third grade teacher, Miss Doherty, was um, fortunate enough to receive a donation of 20 refurbished MacBook Air laptops um, with 10 chargers. Uh, and then through um, some um, fundraising, she was able to um, get the funding for the additional 10 chargers. So she's just looking, we're just looking for approval from, per the policy, from the sub, uh, school committee to be able to accept this donation of 20 MacBook Airs and the 10 chargers. Thank you. Uh, motion approved by Ms. Dari, second by Mr. Dillon. Roll call. Ms. Martin. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Uh, 7.2, budget transfers. Thank you. This is the transfers that come to the committee uh, each, each meeting at this point. Uh, again, following the auditor's recommended process for documentation, but I, I know that's led to some questions, so uh, Ms. Turner is available. Any questions on any of the line items, she can move through those for the committee. Sure. I just had a question on um, uh, the administrative tech software and then the overtime use of buildings transfer. Ms. Turner. So as I explained, I'm trying to be as creative as I can to not leave money on the table. Well, the $337,000, we had purchased Chromebooks on a grant without drawing down the funds, knowing that we could possibly transfer the expense from the grant to the local budget and then allow ourselves to um, carry over the grant money to next year. It's my way of bringing the money forward. So that's what that is. We're, we're transferring money into that account so that we can do a grant transfer over. And the same thing goes with the overtime use of facilities, I mean, use of buildings. Wow the um, facility charges or the overtime cost for custodians during the use of facilities. We usually charge that to the use of facilities revolving account, but we're moving that expense from the revolving account to the local budget to deplete the local budget surplus and carry forward some um, grant funds. Okay. Are we still using the, um, the facilities money though to, to maintain you know, equipment and floors and things like that? The money was depleted at first. I mean, for, with this past year and a half, it was depleted. But yes, it is accumulating so that we can use it for use of facilities. OK. All right. Any further questions? Uh, need a motion to approve uh, 
by Ms. Doherty, seconded by Mr. Dillon. Roll call. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Uh, seven three, consider consideration for option of one year extension of current lease for 155 Merrimack Street. Need a motion to, any comments? Need a motion to approve, uh, well, let me just now. Sure, Mr. Superintendent Woot. Um, my, my recommendation would be that the, cap the committee hear this and table this uh, item at this time to enable negotiations with, uh, with the landlord. All right, so we'll table this to the next meeting or? We'll, we'll, schedule a, a, we'll schedule another meeting, likely yeah. a special session. We'll work with the committee on what that appropriate date is pending negotiations with the, uh, with the landlord. Sure, thank you. Uh, seven four resolution school committee support resolution regarding full state reimbursement for COVID-19 expenses. Ms. Ma Ms. Um, Doherty? Uh, yes, this is the motion I made, uh, the resolution where we're asking the state to pay for any COVID-19 mandates that they uh, impart on us. So I would ask my colleagues to support that, make that in the form of a motion. Okay, um, so I need a motion to approve uh, by Ms. Doherty, second by Ms. Martin. Roll call. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Uh, pa uh, professional personnel, UTL sick leave. Members of the United Teachers will hereby donate 24 sick leave days to Janet Meehan, Merkland School Paraprofessional. Motion to approve by Mr. Hoey, second by Mr. Dillon. Roll call. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. Uh, A2, UTL sick leave. Members of the United Teachers Lowell hereby donate 10 sick leave days to Maureen Rogers Daily School Paraprofessional. Need a motion to approve by Mr. Dakota, seconded by Mr. Dillon. Roll call. Ms. Martin? Yes. Ms. Clark? Yes. Mr. Dakota? Yes. Mr. Dillon? Yes. Ms. Doherty? Yes. Mr. Hoey? Yes. Mayor Leahy? Yes. Seven yeas approved. So before we um, adjourn, just want to reiterate that uh, at a later date, we will um, honor the uh, retirees for this year. Um, so you're not forgotten, but we will have a ceremony in the uh, near future. So I need a motion by Ms. Martin, seconded by Mr. Hoey to adjourn. All those in favor? Uh, We're adjourned. Uh, okay. <laughs> right there, you know, you scared me. I would have given it to her.